Hi, I'm Linda Beale. I'm the Group Product Engineering Lead for ArcGIS Insights and Location Analytics, and I'm joined today by Warren. Hello, I'm Warren Davison. I'm a Product Engineer on the ArcGIS Insights team. And like everybody else, I'm working from home, but I've got my UC swag. Cool, thanks Warren. So today we're going to be going from data to information and then to creating an interactive report that can share out to other people. Now along the way we're going to be showing some of the new highlights on Insights and we'll try and remember to call those out, some of the new features that we've put in there. But we're going to be doing for this whole analysis, we're going to be using the same data sets. So I'm going to start off looking at some of the analysis. Warren's going to pick it up, do some a bit more advanced analysis and also show how we can synthesize that data and then present it as an interactive report. So Warren, why don't you tell us a bit about the data that we've been working with? Sure, thanks. So I've got two data sets that I've kind of prepared for our presentation today. They're both bird themed. We'll be exploring birds and migration. Um, and the first data set is from the North American Breeding Bird Survey. So that's a, a long running survey now, uh, over 60 years that has been looking at a variety of different uh, bird species and populations across the continent and trying to establish some benchmarks for understanding species trends over time and um, possibly identifying certain impacts to those species. The other data set we've got is some GPS movement data from animal tracking data sets from MoveBank. Uh, and we'll be looking at a collection of, of species uh, that we're going to call out um, for that. Cool. So I'm going to kick it off with that then. I guess we're studying this because we couldn't fly, so we'll study those who can fly. <laughs> exactly. We can't go anywhere, so why not figure out where the birds are going? Cool. All right, let's jump into an insights workbook then. Let's start with a new feature. You can now reorder data sets in the data pane. The BBS data consists of several data sets with routes having a spatial component. So I'm going to start by making all of the data spatial and joining the survey numbers to the routes with a compound join using state and province and the route ID. Finally, we're going to narrow down our focus by filtering the species data set to just two different bird families which I can find using the search. So now I can join that third data set and then I can start to create a link chart. So I can, first thing actually I'm going to do is rename that data set to show that these are going to be the two species we're going to look at today, the herring gull and the turkey vulture. And just move that up to the top. So let's get started with the link chart. So I'm going to drag the family and the species to a link chart. So you want to drag two variables, but you can then add in additional variables. So in this case, I want to also add in the uh, English common name so we can see those species that we're going to study. We can also do that directly here. We're using that plus button. And then I want to change how we visualize this chart and I want to change it so that we see it using a radial chart. Being from two different bird families, they have very different wingspan and mass. So let's plot those two numeric variables on a scatter plot. And I'm also going to add in the order, a categorical variable to color it by. I'm going to change one of those colors so that we can more clearly see the two groups. I'm also going to log the y-axis because there are large differences between the average bird masses. So where have gulls and turkey vultures been observed? Now our observations are spatial. We can see the locations on the map. But better yet, we can drag the number of observations to the map. Now here's a little tip. Control and C copies any selected card, and then you can use Control and V to paste it. So I'm just going to copy that card and create Another one, exactly the same. So filtering on this first map card means that we could reduce the spatial distribution to show just the herring gulls. And of course now we can do pretty much the same thing on the second card, 
but this time around I'm going to filter it so that we see the turkey vultures. And I'm just imagining there's a lot of you there going, I didn't know about control and C. I didn't have to recreate that card all those times. Okay, so now I'm going to recolor this card so that we're again matching that same colors that we have on the scatter plot and we'll be able to pick it out. So if you're using the same data set in variables, insights will automatically match the colors. But remember on the first scatter plot, I used order and now I'm looking at single species within each order. So that's why I'm having to actually manually change those colors. As I say, normally insights will automatically pick it up at the same thing. So now I've got both of them. I can just drag one to the other card and you'll see I have both of them mapped on the same card. Just quickly match that. I mean, I'd spend a bit more time normally, but this will give us the idea of putting both of those different distributions for the different bird types on the same map. Okay, what's next? So I want to show you another map type that allows you to show multiple pieces of information by location. So I'm going to add in the boundaries that we have, so the states and provinces. And then I want to join the two data sets together. And I want to do a join rather than an aggregation. So we can do a spatial aggregation just by dragging the points into those polygons. But I don't want to flatten it out. And that's one of the things with insights, we don't flatten out the data. So in this case, I want to have that one-to-many relationship. And I'm actually also going to join uh, spatially, so joining on location. So just to note, we can do it by attributes or spatially, all done in the same place in Create Relationships. OK, so last thing to do on this data set is to filter it down from all of the birds that we have within the order to actually just those two individual species. I'm going to pick it by common name. So um, use the search to find the herring gulls and then the turkey vultures. So now I'm going to select the bird name to map and just quickly sync those two maps so that they're of the, the same area. And now if I open up the layer options, I'm going to go in and change the symbol type to be columns. So I'm going to use the expanded columns. And now I can see the little charts on the map that show me that information. So these charts on maps show a condensed view of multivariate information. And since our last release, we now allow for numeric variables to be included. So previously it used to be just a count. So I can change that to actually be the number of observed birds, which of course makes much more sense. Again, let me change those colors so that they're matching our previous chart and map. And I'm just going to expand that map out. So that's looking at both turkey vultures and herring gulls. Now let's focus on just the turkey vultures on the next page. Looking at just turkey vultures, we see that the number of surveys have increased since 1966 when the surveys first started. If we drag across the number of observed birds, we see they seem to have increased equally. Now, we can actually compare that difference and confirm that that's correct using the percentage change. So to do that, I'm going to go to the action button go to percentage change, I want to change it to the column chart and take the difference between those uh, total number of birds observed and number of surveys that have been carried out. That's going to pop open the table to show that it's done the calculations and now I'm going to put that on a line graph to compare that difference and you'll see there is virtually no difference. That's confirmed that the numbers have stayed much the same over the years in which the survey's been carrying out. Surveys are carried out across a few months, which we can see using the bar chart of both year and month. Most birds have been observed in June.
But if I change the visual to be a chord diagram, we can actually see that some was also seen in July and August. And again, I can change the visual with a single click to a table, and now we can quantify how many there were in all of those months. So I'm just going to remove the year, and now we see that count. Many visualization types have different purposes, so switching between the different visuals can help answer different questions and or reveal different information. So how far do these turkey vultures travel when they're migrating? Well, we started to add more features like calculating geometry, which is a simple click on the actual shape field itself. So in this case, we've calculated the length of the lines that they've taken and now we can see by year how far these birds have actually traveled. Turkey vultures, unlike most migratory birds, actually migrate during the day because they're soaring birds who rely on thermals. So they tend to travel in groups and several of the birds have got tags and they've given them some pretty wonderful names. So have a, let's have a look at these. And that's quite a lot of information on one bar chart. But we now have a new filter in here for filtering out either the top or the bottom uh, sets of numbers that you want. So the, the one with the most or the least. So let's just have a look at the top 15 in terms of how far they've traveled. And we can also add in the labels. We've had that for a while, but we've also we've made quite a few improvements to this. And you can also add context labels as well to all of the, the labeling on the charts. Let's continue to analyze these tracks that the turkey vultures have taken. So this is in the, using the GPS points, and I've converted those points into bins, which are now allowing us to see where the birds have spent more time along their journey, so those areas with the most. And we can also, we have a new tool in here, uh, well, relatively new, uh, that calculates the k-mean clusters, and that way we can confirm where we're actually seeing the sort of the different groups and migration paths that these birds are taking. So you can see those different cluster paths are very obvious. I've selected this middle one here, dragged it out to create a new card so that we can explore these different migration paths that these birds are actually taking. So then I've used the new tool for spatial mean that allows us, I've changed it, done it by month, so that we can pick out those routes that those birds have taken, and we can see where they were by month. So you can see up here in Southern California, they're spending the sort of the summerish months, they're migrating down in March, spending the winter months down in the south, and then travel back up uh, in October time. It's thought that wind is the most crucial factor for migratory birds. The wind speed at the start and end of a migration is actually a range of values in this data rather than numeric value, but we can still analyze them to see the migration patterns. So we're going to create a tree map, and we see that low and end wind speeds are the ideal, and obviously the worst case scenario for survival would be high winds towards the end of their migration. So if we classify this chart by the number of observed birds, we can instantly, instantly see just how smart those birds are, as we see most of them are leaving and ending with low wind speeds. We've already seen that the survey data contains a large number of observation points. So visuals such as maps, where every value is drawn by default, may need to be aggregated to, be, to more clearly see the patterns. We've already seen the GPS data as bins, and scatter plots have exactly the same issue because they use all the points. So we can do exactly the same thing with our scatter plots now and create bins with that information to see that pattern. There's much concern about global warming and impacts on migratory birds. But again, it's not so much about temperature, but concern over wind, wind chills, and severe winds. 
So we're now supporting connecting to data warehouses, namely Snowflake and Google BigQuery. So I'm going to do this next part of the analysis with data sets from there. So although you can do the temporal analysis that I'm going to show with data from any source, Excel, file geodatabases, data, or even data warehouses, we're going to use the data from Snowflake and Google BigQuery. They both contain several years of severe weather data filtered to the wind events. So the Google BigQuery data, in this case, it doesn't yet have a unique identifier. You can select multiple fields and that we will make the unique ID from that, or in this case, I just need the one field. So I'm going to add that unique ID, and now we're ready to add in both of those different data sets. OK, so the first thing we're going to have a look at is the magnitude of the winds. So we have information by state and magnitude, and I'm going to create a box plot of that information. That's going to show us the distribution of those winds. We can also see outliers, so where there are very se severe wind events. And using the fact that we have interaction between the cards, if I map this data, severe weather events, there's a lot of them. As I say, there's five years' worth of data. So in order to see this map a little bit better, a little more clearly, when we're looking at the magnitude, what I'm going to do is rather than just show those graduated symbols, is I'm going to change that to binned data. Now we're seeing the spatial pattern a little bit more clearly. And now with the interactivity, if I select the outliers, I'm also now going to go in and select cross-filtering on that map. So that way it's going to zoom in and just filter out those data points based on my selection on the box plot. So in this case, I'm selecting outliers across a number of different states. You can see it's zooming to that location. And because at that point we're showing fewer points, we're actually seeing the individual wind events rather than the aggregated data. So essentially we're zooming into where we're seeing that information and pulling out the exact locations of the points where we have high magnitude of winds. So we've actually done quite a bit of work on temporal analysis in the last release. And these are the features I want to show you. First of all, starting with moving average on the timeline of these events. So most recently, you'll have seen moving average lines added to reported COVID cases on bar charts. So these are added to smooth the data, take out outliers that might be due to sort of differences in the data collection. So moving average is also used in things like financial reporting, since they don't work at weekends, they're not working days, and they need to smooth out the impact of those two days on the reported figures. In finance, they tend to weight the line smoothing more in the past than in the future. In science, it's more common to use forward and backward data points equally. So we're just going to run it like that. And there's also another very crucial use of moving average, and that is to predict, or more correctly, to interpolate missing data. So temporal data often has missing values, and the moving average can be used to fill in those data points. So if I open up a data table here where I have missing data point of magnitude, which is what we're looking at in this chart, then if we scroll along to where I've run that, in this case, I ran the seven-day moving average, you see it's filled in all of those values. So smoothing out the data, we actually do it almost inversely in insights. So if you look at the broad scale, so in this case, five years worth of data, you're seeing that broad pattern of those temporal events. But now, if you zoom into that timeline, you see now we're revealing all of that detail, and you can even pan and zoom across at that detail level. Pretty smart, eh? Other temporal work we've done recently includes adding temporal decomposition and forecasting. So the first thing we're going to look at is the temporal decomposition, because that's what's underlying for even for the forecasting. So we're looking at the number of severe wind events here 
over five years worth. And using temporal decomposition, the time series is separated into three different components. A seasonal element, a trend cycle, and the remainder values. So the seasonal variation is often seen in data uh, due to factors such as weather and holidays. So the weather one's fairly obvious here. And understanding those periodic fluctuations can be used in planning. So, for example, to understand increases or decreases in labor for demand or products and services. The trend cycle will look like a very smooth version of the source data. And that shows you that broad pattern present in the time series without those minor fluctuations. The trend cycle is used to identify turning points or changes in direction within the time series. The remainder values are the result of subtracting the trend cycle and the seasonal components from the data. Those values allow you to detect any sort of temporal, temporal outliers and anomalies in your data. The seasonally adjusted series combines the trend cycle and the remainder components and are of value in cases where the variation due to seasonality isn't the primary question. So, for example, if you're looking at monthly unemployment to evaluate the underlying state of the economy, variations due to seasonality aren't actually of interest to the analysis. Okay, now let's use the data from Google BigQuery. So, I'm going to enable the location, just cause, because then I can put it on a map, and who wouldn't want to? So, that's the data that we have. Again, five years' worth of weather data filtered out to wind events. And now what we're going to do is actually look at forecasting uh, the magnitude of wind going forward. So I'm going to take the magnitude and the time, put that on a time series, and opening the action button, we will be able to go in and do forecasting. Now remember behind the scenes, this is actually running the temporal decomposition, but in this case we're going to get a forecast. I need to add in a numeric field because we're forecasting magnitude. You can select the amount of data that we use to make the forecast and the number of, of horizon cycles, the number of cycles that you want to predict going forward. In this case, we're using yearly data, so we're going to predict two years ahead. So within our output chart, we get the comparison between what we knew, so the data that we put in, what we forecast, so a nice straight line is, is what we want to see. As I zoom into that prediction, you see that obviously we have the prediction values. We also output the 80th percent prediction interval, upper and lower, and also the 95th percent prediction interval. So one last thing I want to show you is that even though we're doing this nice drag and drop friendly, we're recording all of this behind the scenes. So you have your model. So you can use that model, share it out, rerun it with different data sets. It's also a really good way of actually understanding what you've done as part of your analysis. And you can also see if data is updating. So in this case, I'm connected directly into those data warehouses. If that data updates, what, are this, what, what downstream analysis is going to be rerun when you're interacting with the cards? Okay, that's it for the analysis. Okay, so that's the, the start piece from me. Hopefully you've got a little bit of an understanding more about migratory birds that you didn't know before. So now I'm going to hand it off to Warren. Thanks, Linda. That was great. I think there's some definitely some charts and visuals in there, that analysis that we can use in our story and report later on. Um, the next component we'll be looking at is some a little more advanced analysis with the scripting environment. But while I get set up for that, I'll just maybe pose a question to the audience and get some some feedback there. Um, personally, I think these great events are great for getting a sense of what others are working on. And despite being virtual, they can still be a great chance to get inspired in our own work and see what others are doing. And we'd love to hear how you're using insights. So if you're interested in sharing, maybe just drop a quick comment in the chat section over there, there, or <laughs> there. And we can kind of call those out later in the Q&A and have a good discussion. Cool. Thanks, Linda. Those are some great examples of all the analysis tools and insights, especially those new features. I also spotted some of the great visuals that I'm looking forward to using in some of our reports. One thing I'd like to continue exploring a little further are those GPS points. 
It's always interesting to see where animals are moving during their migrations. But something else that's worth exploring is where they aren't moving. This is especially relevant with birds during their seasonal migrations, since they may be stopping to rest and refuel before carrying on their journeys. Where they stop is often important habitat crucial to their successful migrations. With that in mind, I'm going to make use of the scripting environment to conduct some movement analysis, or more accurately, a lack of movement analysis. So maybe just before diving into this next section, let's see what you're all familiar with in terms of the scripting environment. Maybe you use Python, R, or both, or even none. If you are familiar with the scripting environment, that's great. Otherwise, here's a few pointers to get you started. So within Insights, we have a scripting console where you can bring your own environment. You can use Python or R kernels that you already use and bring those right into your Insights workflow. This allows you to extend the analysis tools within Insights using your chosen scripting language. We have a GitHub repo with all the documentation you need to get you up and running, as well as a bunch of handy examples. In addition, we've also gone and published several blog posts on the subject that walk through some hands-on examples. Turning back to our bird data, I'm going to take a look at those bin GPS points. We can begin to see areas where the point density is significantly more dense than other areas. This leads me to believe they're spending more time in these areas versus others over the course of their journey. I'm going to use some scripts created using the Moving Pandas library to conduct some stop analysis in an attempt to quantify the time spent by individual animals in these areas. So I've already connected my kernel. So I'll go ahead and open the scripting console. And here you can see a toolbar with all the commands to edit, save, and run your script, as well as some insight specific commands for adding the script to your analysis model. So I'll go ahead and import my script and we can quickly walk through it. To start, our script needs some data. Just like the rest of Insights, we can drag and drop data sets right into the console to add them as inputs. Pandas and GeoPandas are baked right into the scripting environment, so data sets will be added as either a pandas data frame or a GeoPandas data frame if it has a location field automatically. From there, we set some parameters for defining what a stop is within the data. I'll be using a duration of 12 hours within a radius of one kilometer. And then this gets output as a new geodata frame with the location and the duration of the detected stops as points. Finally, we pass this geodata frame back to insights using the insights return magic command. And this will add a new data set named layer to our data pane where we can continue to work with it in Insights. To visualize this, I'm going to go and add it to a map and style it by the duration attribute to reveal where and how much time is spent by this selection of turkey vultures. When I add this layer to a new map, I'll update the base map for this card to use the topographic base map. This will allow me to better discern natural features and locations than the custom unlabeled base map I've been using so far. Zooming into these clusters of stationary moments, we can see that this analysis has provided us with some useful quantified measurements for how long these vultures remain in one place and where they like to hang out. Here we can see that the White Tank Mountains west of Phoenix, Arizona are the preferred home range for this particular bird. Now I could obviously get distracted and explore this data further. But for now, let's move on and take a look at how we can turn our analysis into a report or story map. First off, let's get a sense of how you like to share your work from Insights. Is it something that looks like a report, a dashboard style workbook, or are you embedding it in other apps like story maps? Personally, I really enjoy using Insights within story maps. Mixing those interactive charts and maps within a data storytelling narrative has to be my favorite way to share. And that's why I'm pretty sure I lucked out doing this demo. Linda did much of the analysis and I get to do my absolute favorite part and craft that work into a great looking visual. It may sound like the easy part, but there's a few things I always try to keep in mind. First, try to actually make time for preparing your work for sharing. Oftentimes we'll get caught up in the analysis and the due dates 
and forget to ensure that our work communicates effectively. Second, it's not likely that you need to share absolutely everything from your workbook as is. So instead, pick and choose effective elements from your analysis and ensure that they support your narrative. Third, apply some style and formatting. Really make it your own and fit those cards and charts into your branding or color palette. This can make a big difference towards engaging your audience and capturing their attention. With that in mind, let's now jump into some examples using our bird data. So let's get started with this link chart and scatter plot. I really like these as an intro to our story because they give our readers some context. They can click through the family, genus, and species groupings and see how those wingspan and mass measurements change within the scatter plot. This provides some context and I think it would be a nice opening visual to our story. I'll drag these out to a new page in my workbook to keep things organized. I'll give it a new name, and now we can work on styling just these specific cards. As you'll see, Insights has brought along the data sets used to create these cards, and has also brought along the analysis view, which contains all the tools and operations performed on that data up until this point. Another little tip and trick is that as you're styling cards, I like to copy and paste my color palette and all the hex codes for the colors I'd like to be using into a text widget on the page. This will keep them nice and close and I can copy and paste them into the cards as required. With these cards now on their own page, we can focus on applying some style and making them look their best for our story. I've happened to pick these two blue colors, one for emphasis and one for secondary information, while styling these cards. I'll start with making all my nodes in the link chart consistent and applying my secondary blue color. Clicking through the graph legend at the top of the layer options panel lets me cycle through the different groupings and customize all the nodes within that group. Because I still want to demonstrate some sort of hierarchy, I'll make the top order node larger than all the others and each subsequent node slightly smaller. All right. So this is a decent start, but we can do more to make it really stand out. With link charts, you can also style individual nodes within your graph. And this is great for calling attention to specific points within the network. Because I want to highlight herring gulls within this species family tree, I'll make sure the Laridae family has my dark blue that I've selected for emphasis. Going a step even further, I want to call special attention to the Laris genus, to which the herring gulls belong. I think this helps illustrate that despite being your stereotypical seagull, the herring gull is actually just one of two dozen species that calls North America home. To do this, I'm gonna use a custom symbol shape. There's a lot of options here by default within Insights, but to really take ownership of my data visualization, I'm gonna use a custom symbol that I've created. This custom symbol can be created from any image, and I've created one with a gull inside of a circle. And this can be used to represent that node on our link chart. Switching focus to the scatter plot. For consistency, I always think it's a good idea to have related cards appear similar to each other. To reinforce that for these cards, I'm going to copy and paste my color swatch from my text box and apply my subtle blue color to the points on the scatter plot. See, those color swatches are already coming in handy. With that complete, I think that these charts themselves are looking really great and are superb interactive visual for readers to gain some context for our story and also take a deep dive and explore how the size of birds varies between the species. As I finalize these charts, I always like to minimize the card headers and try to ensure that the attributes in the data pane are e have easily understood names. These names clarify the measures and ensures that when my cards are published, viewers will easily be able to tell what values are being plotted in my cards. Just before we share, I'd like to add one final garnish to these pages. As I've been researching and preparing this demo, I've discovered all kinds of neat bird factoids along the way, and I'd like to include these when I embed this content in our story. I love doing this with insights because when these elements are assembled, it reminds me of richly detailed figures and captions from an atlas or a textbook, but with the added perk of being interactive. So here I'm gonna drop some bird wisdom I've gained into an adjacent text box and have that on the page as well. Because I can't bring myself to just put a text box on the page, I'm gonna add this image that looks like a watercolor painting and I'll put my text box on top of that. Using the card ordering, 
we can tuck that image underneath and make sure our text appears on top. So now I think this page is ready to share. Let's go down to the page tab and we'll click share, which brings up this share as dialogue. Here we'll input a title, I'll call it herring gull context. We'll give it some tags to help others find it if they want to use it in their content. And we'll also provide them a description to clarify what it actually is. Then we can share it with our enterprise for others to use and then click share. So once it's successfully shared, we have some options for how we want to access that content. We can view just the shared page itself, access the page item in our portal, or there's the embed option. We can choose custom here and insights will detect the size of the page based on the cards and provide us those sizes in our embed iframe. We can then copy this iframe and paste it in our story map. So here we are in our story map and we'll scroll down to where we want to embed our insights content. So this is a great time to mention that we have a handy embed guide that illustrates with examples different ways to embed insights within a story map and all the different sizes for the content blocks. So here we'll add our web content and paste our iframe and that will load our page embedded in our story map. And just like that, we have some great looking visuals that provide our readers with some context pertaining to the herring gull. Now onto some other examples. So now let's try making another collection of cards for our story that looks at some more of the data. I like how Linda prepared this vulture track data earlier and added their length attribute. This will be a neat metric to explore. I'll start again by dragging this map to a new page in my workbook. I think it would also be helpful to include a chart visual here, illustrating how the distance may vary. I've picked to summarize this chart by year, but that doesn't really help tell the story of each bird, so maybe there's something better. Using a summary table to explore the data a little more, I can summarize the distance of the tracks and aggregate by each bird in the study. This is likely a better way to represent the data to my audience and capture their attention especially since some of the names given to birds are interesting and funny and beg the question, how do they decide on these names? I can use the summary of unique names within the dataset to create a KPI card here, indicating the number of birds in the study. Adding that to my workbook and applying some basic styling, including updating the text color, removing the card border and background, and updating the attribute name in the data pane, makes a nice clean statistic with a sensible title. I also like the additional image Linda included on her page, so I'll build on that idea and adapt it to our color scheme as a nice purple silhouette. If I snug that image up at the top of our bar chart and against our KPI card, we've got a nice little visual layout coming together here. And now, if I go back to our bar chart, I'll follow through with changing the aggregation method to the specific birds and see if that improves things. Since there are so many birds in this study, I'll filter the card to just the top 15 birds that traveled the most cumulative distance and sort those in descending order. I think this gives a little more polish and provides a nice summary to our readers. The final touches are going to be applying my purple color palette to my bar chart and my map to kind of tie everything together. So let's just say that after building and preparing this page that there's still lots of information that we'd like to feature. There's still several pieces of Linda's analysis that we haven't used and are relevant that we could include. As I also drop these onto my page, it becomes obvious that I can no longer fit these neatly within an iframe for our story map, but that's okay. We can use some of those tips from earlier and arrange our content into a report style page to share instead. Through the magic of UC demos, I've done just that and added some of those additional analysis results by dragging cards to this new page. Along the way, I also applied those same formatting tips that we've already touched on, and I've tried to keep my colors consistent between all my cards, and I've sprinkled images throughout to illustrate key results or conclusions 
and to create an overall more immersive experience for our readers. In addition to those extras, I've also gone ahead and added some predefined filters. Filters are another feature that work really well on shared pages. They allowed your readers to interactively explore categories, time ranges, or other subsets of the data. Here, I've added a filter to our earlier map and chart to browse the data by year. Now we can explore the tracks and cumulative distance traveled aggregated by bird and year. This page now more fully explores the data and some of the analysis and fits into a report style page that we can share. With all the work we've put into formatting and providing captions to our work, this report will happily stand on its own. If when you're publishing a report, you'd like to share not just the page itself, but some of the data, you can enable this option during the publishing phase. We have this option on the share dialog to enable viewers to export the data from the cards. This is a great way to disseminate not only your findings from your analysis, but also some of the resultant metrics and data that coworkers can use in their own work. When this option is enabled, when viewers are viewing the page, they can flip over each of the cards on the page and export the data. Visiting our Turkey Vulture page, you'll be able to see that I can scroll down to our cumulative distance chart, flip it over, and export the data set to a CSV. When I create these standalone pages for a story, I'm a big fan of linking the Insights Workbook page as a sort of deep dive. This provides an extra link for readers to explore and gives them the option to dive down the rabbit hole with us into the rest of our analysis, should they wish to nerd out about birds even more. The process for embedding insights in this way is similar to before. However, this time we're just gonna take the URL of the shared page. This will reference our workbook page as an embed card and will link out to our full report. So I think that covers most of what I wanted to touch on with regards to pre preparing your work and showing some of the workflows I use for sharing great content. With the time I have left, how about I try and do a lightning round of my favorite tips and tricks and we'll see how many I can cover. So first up, to achieve that fully immersive experience for your audience, try to blend the boundary between your cards and their background. I always tend to remove the backgrounds and borders from all my cards and this kind of gives me the maximum flexibility for mixing visuals together without any obvious edges or overlaps. Another comment on that is to ensure that the workbook page background matches wherever you're wanting to embed your cards. So this holds true for story maps or experience builder or any other embeds. Next up is stacking cards and graphics. I showed a little bit of this earlier, but layering cards when their borders and backgrounds are removed makes it easy to stack text and graphics and take something rather simple and elevate it to look really cool and custom. KPR cards are one of my favorites for achieving this effect. Along the same line is layering legends. You can pop these out and detach them from their card and nestle it in within some text. This is a great way to invite clicks on your content as these legends are interactive switchboards for creating selections within the related card. A similar interactive tip when picking a small number of cards for embedding Pick those that pair well, and where clicking on one will highlight a selection in others. This kind of kickstarts that exploration for your audience and allows them to interact between cards. Okay, with that, I'm officially done. Let's regroup with Linda, and we'll go over to our Q&A session. All right. Thanks very much, everyone. We really appreciate you taking the time to listen to us. Uh, we certainly had a lot of fun working on this, and we hope you enjoyed listening to it and maybe learned something on the way. Yes. Thanks so, thanks so much for joining us. Um, hope you enjoyed our little exploration of birds and migration data. And, you know, hopefully it won't be too much longer before we can actually go somewhere. Um, but in the meantime, be sure to check out the story map that we've posted and published. That'll be available to kind of look through and as a, a demonstration of what we've done here and how insights can be used in those applications. So thanks very much. Bye. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us for this great session. Well, Linda, Warren, I think you've outdone yourself. Hardly any slides. 
I love it when it was active. So the Do first question, yeah, the first question that I have for you all, was that real? In other words, was any of that pre-canned or was that live on the fly? That was live on the fly. With, I mean, that's, that's the point of insights. We start from a data set and we get going. I mean, that's, that's exactly where the value of insights comes in that you can actually just not, I would say start with nothing. The data is everything. You start with your data and see what you can pull out from it. Yeah, I think that that's an important statement there, right? Data is very important. However, it's not as important as the answers it provides or the stories that it tells. So um, the next question on those interactive reports, um, I'm sensing that a lot of people didn't know that not only can you explore and analyze your data, but you can create some great looking interactive reports directly within insights, but also embed those um, stories directly in story maps or anything else. Um, so the question then becomes, how easy is it to create those reports? I can take that one. Well, it's actually, again, as we showed with insights, it's intuitive to drag and drop and start creating visuals. And there's no you know, coding going on. It's just you're creating and working with your data. And then the best part is that when you find something interesting that you want to share, it's very easy to drag those charts out and create embeds from those. So you don't necessarily need to share the entire workbook that you've been working on. You can speak to just those elements that really tell your story and speak to the metrics that you want to share in your data. Right. I saw a question in here and I'll turn it back to Linda for a second um, about um, the different flavors of insights. You have the online version, the desktop version, the enterprise version. Can you talk to the differences? I know it was answered in the um, question and answer thing, but can you talk to the differences, please? Sure. So you can either get, I'll start with a simple way. You can either get insights in online or enterprise, depending on, you know, however your system works. In fact, there are a lot of people who have licenses for both. But I mean, if we start with the idea of either you work in online or you work in enterprise, then in either case, you will also have access to desktop. Now, it, it is essentially a web GIS. So we're working in the web environment. Um, even the desktop version is using that web technology behind the scenes. Working locally will allow you to use your, your local files, allows you to use the power of your machine, because what we're doing with our analysis is we're always sending all of those queries down to where the data sits. So if you have a big, powerful machine, then you, know, you can take advantage of that by using the desktop version. When it comes to sharing things, then you want to share your data to either online or enterprise, depending how your system works. In terms of connections to other features, that's, not, that's another sort of difference between the two. If you're working with your desktop or you're working with enterprise, we will allow you to connect into databases. We have a number of databases that we support as, as core support. So we have Oracle, SQL Server, SAP HANA, Postgres, bound to forget something. I think that might be it. Oh, Snowflake. Um, and Google, Google BigQuery. BigQuery. See, I knew I'd forget something. SAP HANA. I think I said that. Ah. Um, <laughs> and we also now have a database connector that allows you to connect to other databases. So we have a whole GitHub website that will allow you to set up other databases because we know we can't keep up with all of the questions you're asking us. Can you connect to this? Can you connect to that? So we've done what we can for now to allow you to connect to those ones. So for the connecting into these databases, you will need to either use desktop or enterprise. So that's why if you're in online and you have your database connections, use your desktop version. So that's the way you can the differences there are, but the commonality is, is it's the same. It's the same insights. It will look the same. It will feel the same. It behaves the same. Sounds great. Thank you very much. Um, let me jump over to um, our scripting environment. As we know, ArcGIS Insights can connect directly to your own Python or R kernels. So you can set up a Jupyter Notebook, a Jupyter Labs environment, a local 
kernel um, just on your own system and then you can connect directly to it. What are the limitations there? Do we restrict you in what you can do and what you can't do? And what about uh, koalas? Can I work with koalas in PySpark with our scripting environment? Who wants to take that one? Linda. <laughs> I'll take that one. All right. Cool. So, so in short, what we do, because we're connecting into your environment, is we will allow you to, to put in whatever libraries you want. It's your environment. So, yes, you can you can um, download whatever your, your libraries are you're used to using. Uh, another key point is we'll also bring back the visuals as well. So it's not just passing our data from insights to these kernels, Python or R kernels, and running the analysis in those. We can also, if you create visuals, you can also drop those in as cards as well. In some cases, they can be interactive depending on the, on the library themselves. Um, you also asked about koalas and PySpark. Yes, that's something we worked on recently. So as of a few months ago, Yes, we support those and you can connect into those. We automatically create the data frames or the, the geo data frames either way. So that's, that's kind of built in just by dragging either a data set or the fields into the, the scripting environment, into the console. We're going to be creating those data frames and then you can you know, do your scripting on it. Excellent, excellent. And there's a, a GitHub page to show how to enable the kernel connection, correct? There is. And actually, I gave a link to it in the Insights introduction session. So I have put a link to that in some of the answers that we put today. So there is a, a, a play it again. So you could go, I'd encourage anyone who's asking about, you know, who are new to Insights or who want the details on that, you can find that Simulive session from Introduction to Insights, and there is the link to that GitHub page there. Excellent news. Um, so when we're talking about ArcGIS Insights, I think the name says it all. It's part of ArcGIS, right? It's right. not a standalone separate thing. It's part of the whole WebGIS ecosystem. As a matter of fact, I think a lot of times uh, the Insights leadership calls it the uh, modern location analytics platform. How is it different um, between ArcGIS Pro and ArcGIS Insights? That was a, a question that I just read. Who wants to take that one? Who's that one to? <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll give it to, well, I'll save Warren on this one. I'll give it oh. to Linda. Well, then I'll I get mean, back to Warren in just a minute. It, Pro, Pro is our advanced GIS. I mean, that's that's the, the, the tool that, that does everything, you know? I mean, it, it is Esri's GIS. It, it's the go-to for, for, you know, you, you want to do advanced things, you want to do sort of deep ArcGIS analysis. Insights, I think that fits, for me, it, it fits before Pro. I mean, I love Pro. I use Pro all the time. But Insights allows me to kind of dive into a data set and understand it very quickly. So I can get in there and I, I can see the distributions of my data. I can understand the trends in it and I can understand, you know, what I could maybe do more advanced analysis of. In some cases, Insights has that. So in some cases, if I want to, I don't know, pick a random thing, understand the trend over time or something, maybe a timeline is enough. Maybe I want to go a bit further. I want to say, okay, is this, talking about the temporal decomposition is this what we uh, the overall trend is this what we expect to see by seasons i can do all of that with an insight but maybe i want to go a step further and i want to analyze components of it or something then i might jump into into pro so it, it's never a, it's never an either or to me but mm. you know i i do a lot of gis for some people insights will be what they need and for other people it may be what some people within the organization will need and other people will be working on pro. Very cool, very cool answer. So the same, uh, a similar question, I should say, there's a lot of overlap between dashboards, ArcGIS dashboards and ArcGIS Insights. I believe it mm -hmm. was answered, but can, can you shed a little more light on the, um, the overlap, the differences, et cetera, when to use what? Am I in the hot seat again? I'll Unless take Warren this one. And, 
All right. <laughs> I'll take this one and then Warren can take the next question. So difference between dashboards and insights. Dashboards is, is really good for kind of monitoring data, real-time data. So you've got things updating. You want to see what's changing. It's perfect for that. Insights is much more aligned and intended for you to do analysis and see the results of that analysis. So as I was saying, you know, are things changing over time? Are things changing in their location? We are connected into your feature services, into your databases. So if they're changing, then insights will be changing. You can also schedule insights to rerun things so you can see those updates. We are also creating the models of that analysis so you can recreate the analysis that you've done just by sharing out that model. So it, it's a kind of no code way of, of actually creating your models and rerunning things and seeing things update if you want. But there is definitely a lot more analysis than the dashboard. They are intended on, on seeing things as say, updating things, monitoring things real time. We are a lot more about analyzing the data that you had, see what things have changed from the data that you've been collecting. Cool, thank you. Great, great answer to the question. We get that a lot and quite honestly use the right tool for the right job. Right. Um, I don't believe that we've ever seen an analyst use one tool explicitly. They use a number of tools, starting with Excel all the way up to, you know, you know, SAS. So it's, it's really cool. It's really cool. All right. Um, JDBC style questions in terms of, hey, can I use JDBC to connect to things like Amazon Redshift or Azure Data Lake? Is that yours, Art? <laughs> okay. <I'll take> <laughs> The simple answer is yes. And as a matter of fact, we do have a GitHub page for our connectors that enable you to configure the capabilities of each data source. Um, Amazon Redshift, I do believe, is a connector that's available on that GitHub site. Um, we'll go ahead and post that link to uh, the, the Q&A here in just a little bit. But um, yes, if you can connect to the data source with JDBC, the the quick guide for the connectors will help you um, use the examples that are up there to configure the data source. And then from there, it's plug and play. And then you can start doing things. And Insights will recognize based on the configuration, the kinds of things that you can do and what you can't do. So yeah, the two specific questions, Azure Data Lake, Amazon Redshift, um, and anything else that supports JDBC, which is the cross-platform version of ODBC, if you think about it. So yeah, we support all of that. All right. Um, can I just interrupt you? Just I'm seeing a lot of people sort of saying, you know, where can I get resources? How can I? Uh, I was going know, to go there. there. Yeah. Sorry. Is there like a group of people I can talk to and stuff? So I would encourage everyone to go to our community site. So the team, the whole team, is in there. We are answering questions. We do respond and, and also that is where you will build a community. So that's where people, other people can help and say, you know, we found a way of doing this. But as I say, us as a development team, we go in there and we, we're learning from you. You know, we're building the product for you. So we want to know what, what you want. We want to know what your struggles are. And if we can help you, we will jump in and give you answers. If you're challenging us to come up with something you need development, we are listening and we are watching and we will definitely prioritize the directions we go and any great ideas you have, we will steal them and we will give them back. <laughs> 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 I'm joking. What I'm saying is we, we really want to hear from, from you and know what you want. Right. Great answer. Uh, Warren, I'm going to throw something at you. Can your KPI cards work like the indicator element in operations dashboards? Yes. So our, our KPI cards, you are able to set a target on those and those will respond to whether, you know, it's met that target or where that is. There's some great gauge visuals that will update um, and they're good to include on those, those workbook pages where you've got some sort of metrics that you want to report. So that leans into that kind of report style page versus what we demoed today was more of uh, a data storytelling approach. So it's, it's flexible and you can kind of tailor it to how you want to use it. So we have, thank you, great answer. One, we have one minute left. I first want to 
um, get this out of the way because it comes up quite often. How does insights impact credits consumed through your organization? Are credits consumed per refresh of, anal uh, of analytical tools? Was that yes. to me? You... Go for it, Linda. <laughs> Damn it, <laughs> it's too quick. <laughs> How do we co consume credits? Um, so we almost don't consume credits. There are a few times when we reach out to other parts of the platform, we need to use uh, locational services. So when we are geocoding, only by addresses. So if we geocode by address, there is a credit. If we do drive time buffers, drive time areas, we're using network services. There is a, a credit for that. And if we do geo enrichment, we are using the enrichment service. So there are credits for that. Great. So in general, mostly we don't use credits. Right. And that's a good thing. I just want to say thank you to everybody. We have to end now. It is 8.15. We appreciate your time. Um, take care. Thanks.